Well, thanks for sticking in, sticking with us on the agile leadership track. If you've been if you've been here with us all day, or for a while, and if you're just joining us, well, you are in for a treat. We've got two of my longstanding and favorite colleagues, Henri and Gotham, who are going to talk about some of my favorite one of my favorite topics, which is product thinking, how to treat your products and and anything that you build as your as your product and how that will help you achieve escape velocity. So um, take it away, Henri and Gotham. All right. Thanks, Rita. Mark, very honored to be being here. Well, welcome to our talk and uh, hope you're enjoying spring one so so far. Uh, we're looking forward to the finishing spring one up in a, in a good way. So Gotham and I excited to talk about this. Um, so the pandemic has really driven a massive amount of digital transformation in many different or organizations. There's digital laggers that were left behind uh, while leaders were focusing on building customer-centric product organizations that have flourished. So in this talk, we'll definitely discuss uh, the fundamentals that organizations need to become a product-centric organization, uh, how they mold the practices uh, that are rooted in key princi principles. But we're always really inspired by our famous coach, Ted Lasso, you know, because it's not about the winners and the losers. It's about how do we help these young fellows win. So let's dive in. Gotham? Thank you, Henri. Um, I'm Gautam Palpa, an executive advisor at VMware. I've been working in the digital transformation space for over eight years and have been fortunate to have successfully led and driven over a dozen different uh, transformations in, different, in various verticals. My mantra is transform with empathy. And I believe that the digital transformation needs to be rooted in culture, empathy, people, and process before we can use technology as an accelerator. Uh, I'm a huge fan of cosmology, space travel, and science fiction. And uh, that's probably a different talk than what we are planning for today. But today, I'm honored to be sharing the stage with my friend and colleague of many, many years, Henri Vandenberg. Henri? Yeah, thanks, Gotham. Uh, hey, maybe we should change the talk around. Just talk about space and aer aerodynamics. It's fantastic, right? Yep. Um, but my name is Henri Vanderbalk. Uh, I have the honor of working with Gotham on a daily basis. Uh, I'm also one of the executive uh, advisors. Um, have worked in financial services space, um, also a long time at, at NASA. So some of these things are inspired by these things. Uh, but I've seen a lot of transformations happening in, in organizations. Uh, some fail and uh, some work well. So we hope to share that with you. So according to the IDC uh, research, they predicted uh, that 65% of global GDP will be digitized by 2022 and expected to be about $6.8 trillion worth of value. Now, organizations tend to quickly jump into contemporary practices um, or whatever the practice is these days that they wanna use and then hoping them to be transformed. Now, to really achieve escape velocity, the, the speed by which you can go and get away from gravi gravity. There's a lot of massive opportunity for us to do this the right, the right way. And we wanna share those learnings with you. Now, however, if you look at the current sentiment by the same IDC, we see that the economy has changed pretty rap rapidly. We had the COVID crisis, the economic slowdown, recession, return to growth, and all these phases have also impacted the business focus. So the business has had to pivot on a, regu on a regular basis. But how do you do that as an, or as an organization? And this is really where transformation really comes, comes in, is how do you transform your organization that you continuously can pivot around these events that, that happen? But before we go too far, let's kind of ground ourselves first on what do we really mean with a digital tra transformation? Digital transformation at the end of the day is really leveraging modern te technologies to help achieve a set of business outcomes. And I wanna highlight, it's all about achieving business outcomes or goal goals, in other words, right? You have to set these things first before you really can make um, a, tra a transformation. Now, spoiler alert, um, there's a lot of organizations that fail in doing these because they focus on purely on the technology side. So let's take a look at um, the failure rate of transformation. Everybody jumps and talks about these, start, these items, but what is the failure rate that is currently going on? And it's a whopping 73% of enterprises fail to provide any business value whatsoever in their digital transformation efforts, according to the average group last year. However, leaders that have done this successfully over the pandemic 
they've seen a 2x growth in their company, company size or rev revenue. And furthermore, 78% failed to meet their business objectives. Put another way, only 22% achieved their desired outcome. That's horrific to see. So why does this really happen? Well, let's take a look at another uh, research on Harvard Business Review. And they kind of classify it in two specific areas. One is there's not an agreement on the outcomes that need to be achieved. Again, an important thing we highlight. But two, their inability to scale. They might be successful in maybe creating one digital experience, but how do you do it across the organization? How do you continuously think about this, this the same way? And it's really about how do you create innovation in a different, different way? The transformation and innovation are very corollary to, to each other. Now, I talked a little bit, we we're, we're space inspired. So if we are, we have to give um, some prudence to give a quote by Elon Musk, right? And transformation is really a way of innovating within your organ organization. And I've seen this firsthand at, Na at NASA during the time that SpaceX got started. And it's really um, in those cases where it's physics oriented, but still they're able to uh, create innovation and transforming the whole industry associated with that. Now, as we kind of look at this particular space, we have to understand what are the forces at work in your, in your organization? And again, using the same analogy, we really want to generate velocity, velocity in an organization, and you have to overcome the elements of aerodynamics. First and foremost, mass. Like this is your whole estate of your company. These are alignment, processes, architecture, resources, the technical debt that you might, might have. And the more weight you have, uh, the more thrust you need to be able to get the, velo the velocity. And that's really the inertia and entropy in your organization that is really preventing you from achieving velocity. More on that later. The next part is also overcoming drag. This is the resistance in your organization or like Lamont's law, organization behavior. Organizations are implicitly optimized to avoid changing the status quo in the middle. Um, I've seen this firsthand. We moved to Agile and everything, everybody called, yep, we're doing, ag we're doing Agile, but it's still water waterfall. And that's just the key part that is preventing you and creating drag. But let's kind of again dive a little bit more deeper. Dolphin? Thanks, Andre. So let's um, consider the situation that we're, uh, we are in today, right? The world has evolved tremendously over the last 18 months. We've become contactless, we've become a digital first world. Um, we want instant gratification. Our patience level has dropped considerably. Um, in fact, there was a McKinsey study that was, um, that was conducted, which said that over 75% of the consumers in the US alone, they abandoned their brand loyalty over last year. And that makes sense, right? People were scared, people were stressed, and they wanted to acquire items and commodities as quickly as they could because they didn't know whether the supply chain would be disrupted or whether they wouldn't be able to buy those particular items. And they didn't really care what was on the label as long as it met the purpose and need. And this has been a hard challenge, especially in the retail industry. Um, Experian conducted, um, if you could, yeah, uh, Experian conducted a report that said that over a third of the customers abandoned a search or an online transaction if they experienced a delay of just 30 seconds throughout the entire process. Imagine that, 30 seconds is all that it takes for someone to get frustrated and switch to a different competitor. And that means less money for your organization. And so with such a critical need for delivering value as quickly as possible, we also need to continuously deliver delightful products and delightful features to the customers. And so we need to really embrace a product-centric delivery model. So what does it mean to be product-centric? Um, in order to go down this particular journey, we need to level set a couple of definitions. The first one is product. It's a very critical question, and there are organizations that spend a lot of time questioning what a product means to them. Uh, from our perspective, a product is simply a deliverable which provides a business value to the customer or uh, to the user. It solves a specific problem or the pain that a, a user experiences and Mere code deployed into production uh, environments is not enough to be called a product. Similarly, 
um, having working software is not uh, just a sufficient definition for a product. It needs to be able to solve a particular pain or a problem that the consumer, consumer experiences. And ideally, we want to get some value out of it. Like it can be in the form of a subscription, some purchases, uh, data, maybe even a reputation of the organization. So to truly understand how a product works or how to use a product, we need to have product thinking. And product thinking is that intellectual journey which starts by understanding the consumer's problem and then going designing systems or designing a solution that can actually solve for that pain and then having delivering it and having the user consume and utilize the product. That is product thinking. And it helps us understand our users better and it will help our organizations become more valuable to them. And the best way to understand a user's problem is to empathize with them. But empathy is a very umbrella term. And uh, if you think of the general definition of empathy, it means that empathy is love and understanding for fellow human beings. And it's very broad. Now, empathy is um, not created equal. There are actually three specific forms of empathy. The first one is cognitive empathy, where you have the ability to um, understand what the other person might be thinking, but there is no emotional connection between them. And it's very rational and intelligent response. So for example, if you're a sales executive or if you're a negotiator, you want to have uh, or establish cognitive empathy with the person you're interacting with. The next form of empathy is emotional empathy, where, which is the ability to share the feelings or have a deeper understanding of the pain that someone is going through. It really does affect the way one feels and it creates a genuine connection. So if you have a really performing team and or if you're a team leader and you feel that close connection um, within the team and the camaraderie, that's because you're having emotional empathy. And the third kind of empathy is compassionate empathy, which is not just having that emotional connection, but doing something about it, doing something practical and trying to reduce the pain. Uh, mentoring is a really good example of compassionate empathy. So when you think of it from a product thinking standpoint, you want to exude that compassionate empathy. You want to have the ability to step into a user's shoes to sense from their point of view, the pain or the struggle that they're going through, uh, develop an emotional connection with the user so that you can relate to their pain and then do something actionable that is deploy a product uh, which will try to solve their problems. And that is very powerful. And this is why we need to have empathy within our organization. So Henri talked about the different forces that help uh, achieve escape velocity, right? So let's start looking at some of them. The first one is mass. And this, um, if you are looking at, uh, uh, at the rocket analogy, mass is basically the weight of the rocket um, of all the things that are present in it, the payload. It is the most valuable item that is going to be launched into space. And that is analogous to the product in our perspective. And if we want this product to go and achieve escape velocity and actually be valuable and do the things that it's meant to do, you need to have the right amount of thrust to push it into orbit, right? And achieve that escape velocity. And that is achieved through a product organization. Let's dig in a little deeper into what a project, uh, product organization is all about. So product organization, as you may have figured out already, it embraces product thinking. It means that it focuses on the problem and not just with uh, the solution that you wanna provide. A product organization doesn't have a field of dreams approach, that is build it and they will come. Um, it is not research and development. That's a very major distinction that you wanna make here. Next, uh, a product organization values empathy over assessment. You want to empathize with the user and put yourself in their shoes to truly understand the problem or the pain that the customer is going through. Uh, for instance, let's assume that someone has a severe cough and goes to the doctor. 
the doctor doesn't simply assess and say, okay, you have a cough, here's some cough medication. The patient can do that by getting any over-the-counter medication uh, for cough, right? Instead, um, what the doctor and the other health professionals do is they ask empathic questions to understand what the patient is going through, what are the various things that impact, what caused the problem. They try to get to the root cause before they can decide on the prognosis or the appropriate solution for the problem. And it's the same thing with product organizations. You want to truly understand where the pain is coming from or what the problem is. And so empathy is at the core, is a core tenet of a product organization. The next thing is um, systemic thinking and looking at a holistic picture and not just from the ground up immediately. Um, I'd like to refer to this um, from a Lego perspective. So everyone at some time or the other would have played with Lego bricks. And um, I consider them to be um, like features. There's so much of potential and you can do whatever you want with them, right? Uh, you can build whatever you want, but it doesn't really solve a particular problem. What if we're like Benny, the Lego spaceman, and we build amazing spaceships, but what if the customer wanted a house? It doesn't really solve for the problem that they want. And so we need to dig deep and focus on the macro problem and understand what the customer really wants out of this. And then a product organization must have empowered and enablement teams. And the structure has to be based on the product lines or market segment. And um, this structure is really important and I get to it as one of the anti-patterns in a bit, uh, which is a really good segue into the anti-pattern. And this is something really common that we have seen. It's Maslow's hammer, which says, for everything, for, uh, if you own a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Uh, it's also called the law of instrument. Um, and basically it is, if I have a particular set of skills, I am going to shoehorn every single problem from that perspective and use my skill set for it. And that's not what a product organization should do. The next thing we wanna do, uh, uh, the next anti-pattern that comes out is having a very uh, clinical evaluation instead of empathy. Um, I was working with a biotech organization at some time, which was doing some phenomenal groundbreaking work to improve the quality of life of uh, patients suffering from some really debilitating diseases. And it was fantastic. The tech stack was amazing. We did a lot of interviews with various people within the organization. So I wanna say over 60 um, interviews. But what struck me really hard there was more than 85% of those interviews spoke about the technology, about the deployment approach and the delivery mechanisms, but they hardly talked about the patient. They weren't empathizing with the problem and why they exist as a company. And, th and that's why I say the clinical evaluation or just assessing um, market trends and what we need to do is not enough. It might be necessary, but it's not sufficient. You need to truly understand the problem. Uh, next, uh, there are lots of companies and, and you can take a pick of any, of, uh, any web portal or a self-service mechanism that you have. Many of them are obsessed with features. They just give you the ability to do whatever you want in the, in the guise of being flexible, but that, all it does is introduce uh, confusion to the customers. You don't want to have so many options out there. It's not just about features. The maximum number of features are not going to win for you. Then you have uh, hierarchical, political, or bureaucratic organizations, which is another uh, anti-pattern. Um, these are like you know fiefdoms. People are amassing power and they're running product organizations so that they can have control on what is being released. And they feel that they can shape the direction of the organization. And that usually doesn't work. And then the last one is um, structure. And we talked about it, right? I mean, structure, if it's based upon silos or functions or based upon power, it defeats the purpose of the flow of value within your organization. It increases more friction. And Conway's law is a really good example here. Um, Conway's law, um, as you all know, says that an organization create the structure of a software that an organization develops usually mimics 
the, the organizational structure that it is in. So the more free flowing that you uh, of information that you have within your organization, and the more um, non hierarchical you are, the much more loosely coupled your software is. Um, so at this point, and uh, feel free to join in the Slack channel. I we are very curious to understand what anti patterns are you facing within your organization today. Do you have any different anti patterns? And and this is a learning mechanism. We would love to learn about it as well. And moving on, an organization is nothing without the workforce. And so here are some of the anti-patterns from a workforce perspective that we've seen um, in a product organization as we're building. The first one is not knowing the purpose. Uh, Daniel Pink in his book uh, talks about three important things that a leader must have. One is autonomy, the second one is mastery, and the third one is purpose. If you don't really communicate the, re the reason why a digital transformation is necessary, Nobody is going to really understand why you're giving them so much work. And then if you don't have a clear definition of done, people may not rally behind it because all these digital transformations are hard, they're long and they're arduous. And you can't just go and say, we are going to march on and we need you to have the constant amount of energy. And people are not going to uh, adopt to it if they don't understand where, what the end goal is. Uh, the third one is the sense of urgency. And this is again tied to the why. Uh, consider the rocket analogy, right? I mean, we, as, when the rocket takes off, we are slowly trying to overcome the inertia and start accelerating. But if we really want to achieve that escape velocity, we need to continue to accelerate and not just stop. Otherwise, the rocket's going to fall back to Earth. It's going to disintegrate in our atmosphere. And it's the same situation with the digital transformation. Unless we have a sense of urgency, it could take years for a company to get going on a digital transformation. And at that point, maybe it's a little too late. And then the next one, uh, next two are actually communication, not enough communication and lack of prioritization. As we are spinning up more initiatives, if you're not communicating the purpose properly or the progress or wins, it's really hard to maintain that level of sense of urgency within the organization. And if you don't have prioritization, or if you say that everything is a top priority, nothing is prioritized. And that defeats the purpose. And people need to balance between um, what is um, keeping the lights on versus what are strategic initiatives that have to be executed. We need to uh, provide the right prioritization. The next one are um, empowerment to people, not having enough change agents or people of the right mindset to drive this transformation. And then I talked about this um, incentive to transform. If people do not understand what's in it for them, they really are not gonna rally behind it. So these are some of the anti-patterns for workforce that we've encountered as we work through. But at VMware, what we do is we try to take a 360 degree or a holistic approach to this which means that if your company or your organization really wants to be a digital leader, we wanna make sure that they focus on improving their business and IT alignment. Um, they have a flexible and modern architecture. They are able to adopt newer technology and utilize it efficiently. Security is a first-class citizen. It's not an afterthought. And of course, the total cost of operation has to reduce. But in addition to this, the organization must have a generative, positive, product-centric culture with empathy as one of the core uh, tenets. And at this point, I want to ask you a question and feel free to um, address that in the Slack. Um, I'd be curious to know, how has your leadership been helping your organization become a digital leader in your vertical space? Any initiatives that have been launched to start becoming a leader? I mean, just uh, feel free to add in the Slack channel. So, so far we've been talk talking about um, what we have learned is we need to have the right product that solves a customer problem. You need to have more of a lean approach, reduce the waste, and um, focus on those minimum business increments that are small chunks that actually solve the problems for the customer rather than a big bang approach. We want to empathize with the user and start reducing their pain or solving their problem iteratively. And next, 
we started looking at what it means to have product thinking and how you can create a product organization with self-enabled product teams uh, that are focused on the flow of value within our organization. Now, let's hear from Henri on how we can overcome the other aerodynamic forces and achieve this escape velocity. Yeah, great. Thanks, Calvin. Um, look at the analogy of, of, of Lego blocks. It can always hit home uh, to me every single time. Um, similar to what Ajay talked during the, the kickoff, um, it's about creating flow for developers. Um, it's also creating flow in an organ, organiza organization. And so to do that, we really have to understand what are the elements of a product organization. So we're going to talk to about the, the how to create an organization. But how is not just, just picking things. We're kind of walking through like what are the base principles to do that. Again, to recap of what Goffin was saying is you want to have a product mindset versus project mindset. And a product organization is like your software development organization or your app dev organization. The product team, which is the important part, is those set of resources that come together that create the product from beginning to end. And they can constitute a set of practitioners, like a product manager, a designer, engineer, and solution architect. And then you have a practice lead that is really the experienced person that really helps uh, be the, the master or apprentice model uh, for this. So to recap as well, we talked about the mass and the thrust being the product and the product organization. We also want to make sure that you highlight is that the lift that gets created in an organization is really the leadership that helps create vision and say what is possible in the organization and that articulates the outcomes. The drag is really to overcome that, is establishing a learning organization where you continuously can explore the hypotheses and, and a set of exper experiment, experiments. Let's dive in. We kind of talked about um, what's above the surface, but we also need to understand a little bit what's below the surface. And most leaders, when they start off a transformation journey, they primarily focus on just what's above the water. They might say what the outcomes are, um, they might use some of the metrics, and they kind of jump in right away with uh, selecting practices for the organization. Well, we've seen that that doesn't scale, but just picking practices. You're just picking the how. It's just like picking any technology that's out there that says, this will solve my, my, prob my problem, right? We want to create lift in the organization. Now, as I mentioned, the, some of the decisions might already be made at the top, but we also need to still make decisions at the, below the, wa the water line. So let's dive into a little bit on what some of those things are. But first, let's kind of highlight again um, what it is to make business outcomes. High performance product organizations really drive commercial and non-commercial goals through a set of outcomes that they articulate. They don't articulate the how, they articulate what outcome are they trying to achieve over a certain time horizon. Now, you want to then enable your software development organization or your product or uh, teams to really leverage software and achieve these outcomes. But you want the teams to align to these outcomes and let them make the decisions. Next, as an organization, you want to create a set of metrics. DORA metrics have been around for quite a long time and are very good at understanding the efficiency of your organization. So looking at the research as well, you can actually see how elite performance or leaders leverage these measures to really gauge their performance. And they're really looking at two set of, of, of dimensions, but doing it both at the same time is important to, to measure. And it's not really to help set just behaviors. It's really a way of gauging as leading indicators. Are you moving the right, right direction as an, as an organization? Now, below the, uh, the waterline, we really want to set, make a set of decisions, but they have to be gravitated toward a set of princi principles. So before making decisions about the how, you want to make sure that the principles articulate the why you're making certain things. And this, this is important because this gives the decision-making in an autonomous way to your organization. Anybody can make, this, make decisions within the framework of a set of, of principles, and that creates scale in an organization. So looking at that, you don't want to just copy the Agile manifesto and say, great, we've done Agile, fantastic, pick, these are my principles. You actually want to create principles that are sticky in nature to your organization, things that you value. Um, always be kind or smart principles or embrace change, whatever those things might be that, that resonate with your organization. These make then the fundamental ways for the different teams to make decisions around. 
And you want to accelerate the buy-in in your organization by creating collaboration and hold workshop, listen to other people, what they, va what they value, right? You want to represent the values of the organization. Now, as you establish your practices, you want to create a balance of a set of crafts that form your core practices in your organization. Again, they have to be gravitate towards your set of, pr set of principles. So each team that you have in your organization, again, that needs to create flow in organization, also needs to be able to be empowered to making decisions around which practices to, to use, given their context. Because depending on the type of product, the type of things that they're working on, some of the practices might be different. It has to work for them. You don't want to, like what Gotham said, come in with a sledgehammer and say, these are all the practices that you I still use, right? It doesn't work. It doesn't scale, doesn't scale. And not every software team is the same. The software is not the same. But the practices should really embody the guiding principles and allow them to experiment with the practices to see what, what works, right? TDD might work for one team and see how it works for you. Don't just take the, the definition of TDD. See how it works for you. Are you moving the needle in some of your metrics to really see if you are changing things in your organization? That creates sustainability. Next, you want to create an operating operating model, and these are a set of frameworks and structure from the, uh, that creates bottom up governance and creates a servant leader model um, in the organization. Again, focusing on creating learning inside of your organization. The learning is really around um, employing a agile and iterative way of figuring out through experimentation and allowing the teams to fail in a way in a, that, is safe, that is safe. And then you can achieve critical mass over time um, that constantly repeats over and over and over again as you start learning in an organization. The organization starts feeling more and more comfortable with making these incremental experiments and getting incremental value uh, when you move on. Now, again, they have to be mapped back to your guiding principles so that you don't just pick any framework that helps get governance or creates an operating model. It has to be based on your principles. Now, let's see how all these things kind of come, come together. First, your principles help guide which practices you should, you should use. Those practices then inform how you are going to operate as an org organization. These this is an important aspect of it because as you operate more and more, this is where you start getting scale inside of the organization, where you continuously iterate. iterate. Now, the operating model should really help drive the set of door, door metrics, as you can then measure, measure the different outcomes. And the door metrics then deliver on the business outcomes. So we've talked about a lot of different concepts so, so far. We've talked through what are the different aspects of a product or organization? How you actually make, make decisions? So, Goffin, what do we think we've uh, learned from this session? Cool. And uh, if you can just go to the previous one for a little bit. Um, I'm very curious. It's, it involves a lot of work, um, creating these principles, practices, and operating models. Um, it's, it's a lot of work at the tactical level. Right, and that's why these are below the 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 waterline, so to speak. What a lot of um, organizations focus on is what they can do most. What are the business outcomes? And some of them, one of the anti patterns that we've observed, at least, is that rather than truly thinking about them as business outcomes, they think of them in terms of ROI or return on investment, and that actually is an anti pattern. You don't want to limit yourself to just the revenue that is coming in because all revenue does not have to be good revenue. You want to really focus on the purpose or the or why you are working so hard and developing all these things towards your business outcomes. And your business outcomes should always drive your vision and actually um, your aspirational state, which is the mission of your organization. So that's something I do wanna call out here. It's very easy to focus on what's visible because those are um, the things you wanna have the vision and the mission statement of your organization, of your department, of your product organization even, but you really wanna dig in deeper and say, 
how are we going to accomplish? It's not just enough with what has to be done. First, understand the why, understand what, and then how. Those are the most important things. So let's, let's um, start wrapping up because we are the only act that is, that is stopping you all from having a very peaceful evening with either your significant other, your uh, favorite people, your pets, or your favorite beverage. So let's start wrapping up. Uh, first, we learned about digital transformation, what it really means. Uh, we also investigated why so many of them failed. Uh, especially two of the top reasons why they fail, one being the unspoken disagreement among the top managers or the executives about the outcomes. Some probably want to look at the ROI or maybe other operational metrics, while others want to look at much more of a future-proofed or horizon two and horizon three outcomes that they want to use to future-proof your organization. The next one is an inability to scale. They probably haven't figured out the day two operations or what if we achieve what we want to set out, uh, what we have set out to achieve, but then they don't know how to scale it and replicate it for multiple teams. Those are the two predominant reasons why they fail. We then talked about some of the forces that help and hinder an organization uh, from taking off. So we talked about what a product means, what product thinking actually is, why you need to have empathy as part of the organizational culture. And we talked about some of the patterns and anti-patterns, not just for creating a product organization uh, within your company, but also how to uh, ensure that you have the right motivation and the right, right level of excitement within your workforce to drive and accelerate your um, digital transformation. We also talked about um, how to build or restructure this. So how to define uh, your outcomes and metrics and why they're so important, why, why we need to have principles, why we need to have practices, why we need to have an operating model and how they all connect together. So similar to SpaceX, um, the way in which it focused on reusable components in their philosophy and reusability of spaceships and of rockets and all these various items, we need to have successful patterns in our product organizations that become part of our culture. And those can be used to not just accelerate your digital transformation, but they also help you to achieve success or whatever you define as success for your digital transformation. And not just stop there, but we also wanna make sure that these successful patterns will help uh, sustain your digital transformation. There's a lot of inertia within, within our organizations. Um, the, if you do not constantly keep them evolving and transforming, inertia sets in and they are bound to swing back to the older way in which they perform. And that is another anti-pattern that you all need to be sensitive about. It's not just a one and done approach. We need to make it part of our culture, we need to make it continuous and continuous improvement is something that we all have to do. And that means embracing a lot of mechanisms uh, to help promote this product thinking approach within your organization. So what if we put this all into practice and start on your digital transformation journey? Um, I would recommend, and, and this is what Andre and I would like you to do is, why not start small? Why not start to develop some lean experiments for your organization? Um, if if uh, you're not familiar with the lean, appro lean experiments approach, um, the structure or the format is this way, where we say that, uh, we create a hypothesis and we say that we believe that performing a particular activity, which is our solution hypothesis, uh, for a particular set of people, and these are our market fit or our target audience, when we perform that activity for those people, it will achieve some outcome, which is a measurable, quantifiable outcome that you can get. And then we know that we will be successful if we get a measurable signal uh, from our experiment, and that becomes the measured goal. So this is in the format of a lean experiment. Um, you have a solution hypothesis, a market fit or a target audience, a measurable outcome, and a measurable goal. 
to evaluate whether you have to pivot uh, if the experiment has failed or persevere if the experiment was successful. And this has been very powerful. This is the build, measure, learn approach of lean experimentation, where you build a small minimum business increment. You then um, uh, implement it, collect data out of it. Then you, you measure it through all these measures and metrics that you have decided. Then you analyze the data and you figure out whether this was a successful thing, whether you are to, working towards your measurable goal or whether you're deviating from it. And you learn from those data that is there. And it becomes a much more data-driven approach rather than an emotional response. And once you have that data, you then are empowered to formulate whether you want to continue with this particular experiment with maybe a different team and try a different variation, or if you failed and you have to abandon it. And both of them are good. If you fail when you run this particular experiment, it means that you gained some validated learning for your organization. And we encourage you to share that failure at that point of time, because the failure of one team or one experiment is validated learning for your entire organization, and that is priceless. Um, so we would love to learn more about your experiments and their outcomes. Feel free to share them on your favorite social media. You can use the hashtags Escape Velocity and Tons of Value Advisors. Uh, Andre and I are Tons of Value Advisors at VMware, um, and, and hence that particular hashtag. You can also email us at townsvalueadvisors at vmware.com so that we can also um, at least vicariously be on the journey with you as you are going through these experiments so that we can learn from your successes and from your failures and we can improve our own models and our hypotheses as we are developing them in the field. And that helps create that shared learning approach, which is so much of a, a primary tenet of DevOps and Agile and Lean. Um, I did put a quote in there so, uh, when we were talking about agility saying, there's, there's, there's a lot of organizations that focus on the ceremonies of agility and the way in which you do something or the roles that an Agile organization must have. And the, if you are obsessing over those things, and you are not embracing the spirit of agility or the mindset of agile, you are probably still a waterfall organization. So you want to be very careful of not focusing on the wrong things there. Then, you know, if you do feel that you want some help building your experiments or you have specific problems that you'd like to uh, leverage Henri and I or any of the Tons of Value Advisors on, feel free to email us or hit us up on Twitter or LinkedIn and we're more than happy to share and learn and interact with all of you. I wanna end um, this particular talk a few minutes early because I know that, uh, you know, it's been a long day. You've all been intellectually stimulated by a number of these talks. You're probably tired. You're probably on your third um, vodka tonic, um, if you're like me. Uh, but regardless, I want us to be empathic to your day and the way you've been um, you know, absorbing all the information on spring one. And um, I want to thank you all for attending this session. And Henri, do you want to um, say a little bit more about Ted Lasso? Because he's one of our role models. He, he's definitely our model of how to transform um, by free, free believing. So we really believe in, in, in you uh, that you're able to learn from this, experiment from this as well. But um, like, like what Gotham said, it's, it's about experimentation. It's about learning. Uh, gravitating towards a set of key princ principles you want to set for your organization. And again, that really helps create the escape velocity. So with that, we thank you for taking the time to listen to them. We finished early. We will be hanging out in the Q&A. Engage with it online. I started to see some, some Twitter uh, feedback already, so that's just great. So engage with us there in the Q&A. Thank you so much. Back to you, Rita. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh... Taking us home, gang. And hey, uh, I think Henri and Gotham made it made it obvious they'd love to hear from you. So please engage with them. They've given you many options. 
Uh, and again, thank you everybody for sticking with us and thank you all to all our speakers and guests. Have a great rest of day.